hey, so abortion, that's a thing. People are talking about this. In the US, Roe v. Wade, whoever that is, was recently overturned and more than 10 states have either banned or imposed restrictions on the abortion procedure. Was this good or was it bad? People are asking this. I'm going to ask this. Now, in this video. So, just a quick disclaimer. I am 100% pro-choice. I think the overturning of Roe v. Wade was bad, but I do think the abortion debate is a lot more complicated than some people give it credit for, and I am going to talk about some places where I think my side's arguments can fall short. So, part one, choice versus life. So from my experience, there are three main places the abortion debate can go. There's pro-life versus pro-choice, which weighs the bodily autonomy of a mother against the fetus's right to live. There's the argument about whether or not a fetus has any right to life at all. In other words, where does life begin? And there's the discussion of what the world would look like if a pro-life or pro-choice position is put into practice. Starting with the first one, you can probably guess why this conflict is so never-ending. One side will say, my body, my choice, and the other will say that your right to choose ends where another body begins. Or something like this. When women say, my body, my choice, I agree. Yes, we have the right to our bodies and our bodily autonomy. Women and their bodies must be respected and protected. Bodily rights are especially important when a woman is pregnant, because there is more than one body involved. After all, carrying a baby is a bit more complicated than, say, carrying a football. And here you have the infamous clash of pro-choice versus pro-life, where the unstoppable force of bodily autonomy meets the immovable object of, well, what about the autonomy of the body living inside of you, hmm? It's easy to see why arguments like this can very quickly reach an impasse. If you're a pro-lifer, you will almost definitely believe that life begins at conception, meaning that someone using their bodily autonomy to have an abortion is the same as someone using their autonomy to kill a three-year-old in the street. Now, if we can show that a fetus is not a person, the problem goes away. But the way you get there can be a bit tricky. Some people, and by people I mean middle-class philosophy students, will try to be extra clever and argue that bodily autonomy trumps the pro-life position even if you agree that a fetus is just as much a person as a fully grown adult. Personally, I think this approach is very unnecessary and ultimately flawed. And I will now demonstrate this through the medium of two blokes arguing on the internet. Okay, Ooh. I think I think I can meet you halfway here. Let's just say I agree that life, personhood, begins at conception. I think the pro-choice argument still works. Let me just ask you some questions. Do you like freedom? I'm sorry, what? I don't like freedom, okay? I love freedom. Freedom can come over to my house and f my sister. Okay, so- No, 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 no. Let, let me stop you right there. Do you know who the f you're talking to? Brother, my middle name is Freedom. My last name is Freedom, and my fucking first name is Freedom. I support women's freedom just as much as I support a baby's freedom not to be killed in the womb by some Nazi Democrat doctor. Yield. Okay. So, my next question is, it's just yes or no question. Do you support the right to self-defense. <laughs> of course I support the right to self-defense. My middle name is self-defense. Cool, so. The second amendment, the right to bear arms, the right to rise up against government tyranny. It might not be this year, it might not be in a thousand years, but when the time comes, you'll bet your hickory sweet ass the American people will be armed and ready to give them hell. Kyle Rittenhouse, 2024. Okay, so why do you not support a woman's right to defend herself against a fetus? Hey, hey, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Against a person? Against a parasite of a person. 
a person who is attacking her body, sapping her nutrients, making her sick, permanently altering the shape of her body, causing her emotional torment, increasing her chance of death? Uh... Like, I'm sure you agree that self-defense doesn't have to be proportionate, right? If someone attacks you with a golf club and all you have is a gun, you should still have the right to use the gun because they're the aggressor, right? Well... Yeah, but you know... Uh... So, if you can use legal force against an adult aggressor, why not a fetus? Sorry, sorry, uh, a very young person. But surely, your bodily autonomy matters more than someone who is deciding to physically attack you. Um, decided? No, 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 not even decided. Look, this... This is why I keep telling you to watch the Philosophy Tube video. Oh, Christ, not the Philosophy Tube video again. Look, 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 it, it's okay. I'll walk you through it. So there's this pro-life radio host who gets kidnapped. He wakes up on the floor wired to a violinist who has kidney failure, and if he disconnects himself, the violinist will die. So they can't do a transplant? Well, there's no, there's going to be one, but it, it doesn't happen. Uh, never mind that. Basically... In this hypothetical, he could be there until the violinist dies of old age. The point is, do you think he has a right to disconnect himself? Uh, yeah. Wait, really? Yeah, but... Um... Well, so you agree. By disconnecting, he is physically taking a life in exchange for his bodily autonomy. You just admitted that. Sometimes bodily autonomy trumps the right to life. But, uh, <laughs> oh, did the radio host choose to be kidnapped? So is this, you're, you're really going into Did that. the radio host choose to be kidnapped? Well, no, but like, wait, come on, like, not all women choose to get pregnant either. Not just with rape cases, but like, you know, contraception isn't 100% effective either. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Before we do that. None of that matters because you would still be pro-choice even if no one took any precautions, right? Um, yeah, sure. Good. So the problem is, this philosophy tube video is, what's that word you communists always use? Uh, it's disanalogous. First of all, with respect to <laughs> all the ladies out there, nine months of pregnancy and childbirth is not the same as being indefinitely wired to a comatose patient on the floor. I know, <laughs> cancelled for misogyny, but also, brother, you can choose not to have sex. Yep. Okay. Yeah. There. It, there it is. Like. Yeah. Just, okay. Amen, brother. Just choose not to have sex. Five head. Like, I'm sorry. Is that an argument? Mm. Look, I don't want to be mean. Okay. I love women. I have a wife and three beautiful daughters, after all. Okay, let's do it this way. Now, <laughs> I know you're not a parent, but, but that's okay. Let's say you're not the best driver. You're out in your car at night, you make a mistake, and you crash. You're fine, but your three-year-old child in the passenger seat is dead. Well, that's a bit grim, but sure. Yeah, but... Let's say an angel comes down, the angel's name is Shen Babiro, and he says, let's just say, hypothetically, I can save your kid, but here's the catch. If I do save this kid, I need to cast a spell that makes you experience nine months of pregnancy and then childbirth. Now, my liberal friend, here is the million dollar question. Are you going to save your child or are you going to choose your bodily autonomy? Yeah, I'll save my child, of course, but like, you realize that doesn't work here, right? Because I've chosen to raise that okay, child. Okay, 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 okay. Don't, don't get triggered. Let's say it's not your child. Let's say it's your friend's child. My child. Let's say it's one of my three beautiful daughters. Let's say it was some random kid in the street. Is there ever a time where you would let a child die for your mistake? Okay, no, but I mean... Well, no, I don't know. Like, have you heard how bad some pregnancies can be? Like, that isn't even to mention all the ones that can kill you. Not only that, but did you know a woman is significantly more likely to get murdered when she's pregnant? Like, you have to factor 
all of that in. Like, maybe you should still have the choice in that situation. Like, I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> well, but it wouldn't be a hard question if we were talking about a fetus. Would it? Well, no shit. But you said your argument would work if fetuses were people. Now, why are you treating a fetus different from a three-year-old? It's like you don't really think the fetus is a person. I'm sorry, brother, but your argument fails. Uh. <laughs> Liberal destroyed. Trump 2024. Fuck Biden. So this is the best deal man I can give of both sides, and I honestly don't know what the counter is here. If you do, um, leave a comment. But from here, it always feels like the bodily autonomy argument is implicitly standing on the idea that a fetus is something different from a person. And although I do think Abigail had a lot of other good points in this video, I don't think this violinist comparison really works. The whole premise of her argument is that bodily autonomy can override a fetus's life, even if that fetus is seen as a person. So during tonight's operation, I'm going to assume that the pro-life people are correct when they say that a fetus is morally fully equivalent to a grown human being. And I hope if you believe that, you'll stick around and watch the whole thing. Now, obviously there is a level of threat and suffering where we do think it's okay to kill people, say in war or self-defense. So when she switches nine months of pregnancy and childbirth for spending the rest of your life on a hard floor wired to a human vegetable and completely ignoring the choice factor, it looks like she's trying to force the level of suffering to a point where we're not really talking about pregnancy and abortion at all. But I did say I was pro-choice, so let's try another approach. Part two, when does life begin? So just to avoid any confusion, I'm not gonna make any distinction between life and personhood here. I'm just gonna use the two words synonymously, so as soon as we decide that something is a life, that's when it deserves protection. First, we have life begins at conception. And there are lots of reasons people believe this, but one of them really is just that it's simple. While sperm and eggs are technically alive, they are distinctly different from what we would call a human life. When fertilization happens, that is technically when you become you, a newly formed, genetically unique organism. In other words, a human being. Or single cell embryonic human zygote to be exact. And we know today that your genes are effectively switched on pretty much within the first two to three days of fertilization. So if your unique human development starts at conception, it seems logical to say life begins at conception. And there are a few arguments you can make against that. Let's start with the bad ones. One, it's not a life, it's a cluster of cells. Uh, I'm sorry, I think you'll find you are a cluster of cells, Alan. Your mum is a cluster of cells. What are we all, if not clusters of cells? Are we just going to look through the human development cycle and arbitrarily decide how many cells you need to be a person? No. Two, it's not a human life because it's not a moral agent. Um, is a one-year-old a moral agent? No. If you've met one, you know. Three, it's physically tied to its host. Well, it's also tied to the host for a good while after the point of viability. Is a newborn child fair game so long as it's still attached by the umbilical cord? No. Four, it looks like a dolphin fetus. Have you not seen the Charlie Kirk debate? Do you truly in your heart of hearts truly believe that this is a human being? This? Without a doubt. Without a doubt? Yes. This is a dolphin fetus. <laughs> Okay, so that one is very good for getting dunks, but I don't really think I could use it as a rationale. Are we saying a child needs to look a certain way before we grant it protection? And if they were ugly or ambiguous enough, it would be okay to kill them? Well, as long as no one tells the elephant man. Honestly, the thing with Life Begins at Conception is that it actually is one of the easier positions to defend. Conception is the beginning of your, um, 
journey as a unique human organism and putting that starting point somewhere else can be a bit awkward, but not impossible. Here's a better question. Why do we struggle to agree on where life begins when it's so easy to agree on where life ends? If gene expression really is the starting point and essence of human life, why do we find it so easy to pronounce people dead before their gene expression has ended? Because yes, gene expression does not immediately end when you die. Some genes even become more active when you die. On top of that, your cells can still grow, your hair and fingernails don't continue growing, that one's a myth, but what you can do, even after death, is give birth, a phenomenon that goes by the charming name of coffin birth. So if gene expression can continue after death, what is death? Well, apparently scientists don't agree on this one either, but they generally give two answers. One is when the heart stops, but you could also argue that not every stopped heart counts as a death. Doctors will often try to bring a stopped heart back with a defibrillator, and sometimes during surgery they'll even push someone's ribs apart and try to massage the heart back to life with their hands. The second answer they'll give is brain death, and this one is a lot more final. When the brain dies, it can't come back, and the patient is legally dead. Now I don't want to get too far into the science here, so I can just simplify and ask, if a brain dead patient could have the rest of their body kept alive by machines, would they still be alive? My answer would be no, and when something similar to that happens in real life, it looks like doctors agree. Why is that the case? Well, I would say it's because the thing we're tying to the brain is human consciousness. So when we talk about protecting human life, we're not really talking about protecting DNA or cells or genes, we're talking about sentience. That's the thing that makes us alive. Or I was thinking if this was a philosophy tube video, this is where I would throw in the Descartes reference and say, I think therefore I am, and I'd maybe say it in Latin first, but I can't pull that off. And when it comes to abortion, it turns out that humans first start to gain some level of sentience at around 18 to 25 weeks, which is roughly the same time we consider to be the point of viability outside of the womb, and well past the time of elective abortions in most of Europe. Now, some of you might jump in here and say, well, what about people in comas, or someone who's just been knocked out cold, or someone who's sleeping? Can we kill them because they don't have consciousness? To which I would say we do protect those people, but it's on the basis that we expect them to regain consciousness in the future. Ah, but couldn't you apply that same argument to fetuses? Should we not protect them because they might gain consciousness in the future? But that, I would argue, is comparing apples to oranges. In the case of a coma, their conscious experience has already established itself. The thing we're protecting already exists, and that isn't the case for the fetus. And we don't typically protect things that have never existed yet. A seed is not a plant, etc. So going with consciousness, we now have a measure for life beginning and ending in the same way. And that's just nicer, isn't it? The one last objection you might have is, well, isn't that just kind of arbitrary? And yes, it is arbitrary. It's just as arbitrary as any other point you could use. The reason I would say this one is preferable over all the other ones is that in practice, it works. Almost all abortions will happen before this point, and for the ones that happen afterwards, well, that's when we're getting into the area of health emergencies, and in that case, you're kind of forced to choose one life over the other anyway. In practical terms, a society that believes life begins at consciousness can function in a morally consistent way. Whereas if you want the world to act as if life begins at conception, that can take you to some very strange places. Part 3. A Feast of Bullets So if we're talking about positions we could actually practice in real life, let's see what might happen if you truly believe life begins at conception. First, you would immediately have to rule out contraception pills because their function is not just to stop eggs from fertilizing. They can also thin the lining of the uterus and stop fertilized eggs from implanting in the womb. 
In other words, they can allow a life to be conceived and then take it away immediately afterwards. If you believe life begins at conception, then those pills should be at least as horrifying to you as the act of abortion itself. Probably even more so because lots of people take the pill and, you can imagine, those things are slaying. If that's not enough, then allow me to introduce you to some of the worst extermination camps on Earth. Fertility clinics. In a fertility clinic, eggs and sperm are extracted from people who are struggling to have babies and then fertilized in a lab. The egg is then transferred to the mother's body, hopefully it implants, and she becomes pregnant. This method of conception outside the body is called in vitro fertilization, or IVF. The problem is, IVF doesn't always work, and so these clinics will always fertilize more eggs than they need. The ones that aren't used immediately are either placed into tubes and frozen, or are just thrown away. In the UK, this has been the fate of almost half of them. In other words, millions of human lives bred and slaughtered in broad daylight. And this is where we get to imagine a whole bunch of weird scenarios. Suppose you're in a burning building with two exits. On the way out of one is a one-year-old baby, and the other has a case with 1,000 IVF tubes. If you believe life begins at conception, you would have to save the tubes. And then probably explain to the screaming mother outside that at least her child was incinerated for a good cause. As you can imagine, a lot of pro-lifers are very reluctant to bite this bullet. Sometimes they might just say, okay, maybe life begins at implantation rather than conception. To which I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask, why? Is there any good reason to think an egg is less of a life before it implants? Or are you just moving the goalposts because treating fertilized eggs like people is completely unfeasible? But maybe there is a good reason for life beginning at implantation and I just haven't thought of it, so let's go with it. Because if we're saying life begins at implantation, then now I can introduce you to the next worst thing after fertility clinics, miscarriages. Now, miscarriages are not deliberate, so we can't really call them infanticide, but they are a pretty destructive act of nature, so... more like a... pandemic, perhaps? Really more like a plague. And if you believe a miscarriage is the death of a person, then there are a few more bullets you have to bite. First, you'd have to be willing to invest an obscene amount of money into research towards stopping miscarriages. If it came down to a choice between that and... I don't know... Trump's wall, you would have to choose the former. In the meantime, we definitely have to enforce some kind of um, lockdown, or in other words, ban sex until we can figure out what the hell is going on. If the cure for miscarriages came out in the form of some kind of vaccine, you would have to mandate it. Obviously. What are you, a f baby slayer? And if it turned out the best way to stop miscarriages was to reinforce the sperm of men, and the side effects of that treatment involved something like periodic bleeding with violent stomach cramps and mood swings for, say, five days out of every month, and at least once or twice in your life you have to push a lemon-sized object out of your dick hole, you would have to accept that. Now, I know that's an absurd hypothetical, but it does show how far someone would have to go without breaking that initial principle. But you don't even really need an imaginary situation to show that. Some people, in fact, some countries, will make an exemption to allow abortions in cases of sexual assault. But if we're being brutally honest, the question again would be, why? Maybe you could invoke bodily autonomy here because the victim didn't choose to get pregnant, but even here the pro-life position is kind of unclear. Are they really going to say it's okay to punish a child for the sins of its father? If a child is conceived of rape and that's where their life begins, is there any meaningful difference between aborting them at six weeks and drowning them on their first birthday? Well, if you think the fetus is a person, then not really. If you really are pro-life, the only reason you would allow abortion in this case, but not for, say, a consenting adult, is because saying no to the 10-year-old makes you feel queasy. And this is where I think the pro-life position runs out of steam. 
And unless you think life begins at conception because God told you, in which case my God just whispered in my ear and he says you're full of shit, <laughs> then you do have to deal with the idea that your marker is just as arbitrary as any of the other ones. Now, if you want that to be your personal marker, that's fine. But it does become a problem when you try to impose that morality on everyone else. Because in practice, there is no pro-life position. It's a pro-birth position. The people who legislate against abortion don't care what happens to the child after they're born. They're often the least likely ones to step in for parents who can't afford a child, for the countless problems with adoption and foster care systems, for the emotional baggage of being an unwanted child. And they're not even really banning abortion. They're banning safe abortions. As for coat hangers, illegal procedures, potential increases in pregnancy-related deaths, at least three women dying in Poland to pregnancy complications because of the chilling effects placed on doctors, that's all fair game for a law that isn't even guaranteed to reduce abortion that much. I mean, mate, it's the 21st century. Come on. Lacrimosa Dissila Quan Risurget Ex Fa Te La Iudica Ooh.